Joining Samin in our live discussion today on food, art, culture, and cooking are partisan Frank Stitt, who are the owners of restaurants Bottega, Bottega Cafe, Chef on Fon, and Highlands Bar and Grill, which received the James Beard Foundation Award for Outstanding Restaurant in 2018. We're thankful to these esteemed culinary artists for being here on this virtual platform. And we look forward to a lively and inspiring conversation uninter uninterrupted. Please remember that there will be a short Q&A with the audience at the end of the program. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Samin, Frank, and Pardis. Thank Hello. You. Hello, Samin. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm so happy to see you. Uh, you. <laughs> Thanks for that warm introduction, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> You're most welcome. It's nice to spend a Sunday afternoon with you, Sammy. So nice to see you. I, the only thing I regret is that I this is uh, the second time I've been thwarted from coming to Birmingham in person. So, so I'm going to have to make it a third time. Will be the charm. That's right. That's right. We'll do it again. We've got some plans for you when you do make. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Itinerary. <laughs> you know, so I, mean, I, um, I just wanted to to start off by saying that when I got your book, uh, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, took it home, read it. The next day, I went into the restaurant, and it was like a manifesto of, <laughs> "Okay, guys, this is it. Everything's got to be in balance." You know, you start off with salt, then there's fat, there's acid, which is so, so important, and then heat. And so I was writing these notes in, in all the kitchens. And stir, taste, adjust became a mantra. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, so you funny. know, it seems kind of self-evident, perhaps, mm -hmm. but it is so elemental to good cooking that that you really do. And the one thing that was kind of revolutionary was your amount of salt of <laughs> cooking. And it really, you know, pasta water has got to taste like the sea. And, but you use that, you've taken that to a whole nother level and it's just brilliant. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, coming from you, like an established chef, you know, that's the highest compliment, honestly. Because that's really what I was aiming to do was to translate what I saw for all of those years happening in restaurant kitchens that I felt wasn't being translated for home cooks, you know, and my journey started in that way. You know, I grew up um, eating really delicious home cooking, right? My mom is an extraordinary cook, made delicious Persian food my whole childhood, but I didn't really cook as a kid. And then I sort of had this series of serendipitous events that brought me into Chez Panisse first as a busser and then like curiosity brought me into the kitchen, but I had no training. And so they gave me this stack of cookbooks and they said, go read these books. This is how you're going to like build a foundation. So I went home and I read books and I cooked from books and then I would come to work. But what was, what I was watching the chefs do was so different than what I saw in the books because people didn't follow recipes. You know, they didn't, have amounts and measurements and timers and, you know, rulers, <laughs> they right. used their senses. And so, and um, they were sort of always just, and these words always kept re being repeated, salt, fat, acid, salt, fat, acid, salt, fat, acid. And so it probably took about two years for me to notice this, this, this pattern that these were these things that they were always sort of navigating the kitchen by. And they were kind of like the four points of the compass. And one day I went to the chef, to, who really is my mentor. His name is Chris Lee. And I said, you know, I think I see something. I think I see like salt, fat, acid, heat. And he was like, yeah, we all know that. Like that's, duh. He's like, <laughs> and I, I was like, why didn't anyone tell me? It's not in any of these books, you know, like it's not written anywhere. It seemed like this big sort of, if they all knew it and it wasn't in any of the books, it felt like I was being betrayed if nobody was explaining it. So if nobody had explained it to me, I felt like nobody was explaining it to anybody else. And so I, I, I wanted to be the person who, who then could explain it to people. But it still took me a long time to sort of take in all of the information, understand it, and then be able to distill it into a really simple philosophy. So to hear that it landed with you, you know, that's like, I mean, that came full circle. So that's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> well, it landed. And I think also with, with Frank, you know, we always talk about taste, taste, taste. But what does that mean? You know, what are we talking about? And so I just think that that just really, I mean, I just feel like that helped you to really 
explain to our cooks, you know, what, what they're looking for. You know, and it's so, be you know, and, and acidity is so important in, mm-hmm. you know, in whether you're talking about making wine or cooking, mm-hmm. you know, and I just think that that's something that some Americans have been a little reluctant to embrace that acidity is a really good thing. It's all totally. got to be in balance and it, you know, a little bit of vinegar often just wakes up, you know, whatever it is that you're cooking, a soup or a sauce, whatever. Absolutely. I remember for me, like the big moment was when I made a carrot soup, you know, which like you think of carrots being really sweet and it had onions in it, all this sweet stuff. And the chef told me to put some vinegar. I thought it tasted so good. He's like, oh, it needs some acid, put some vinegar in it. I was like, are you crazy? Like, why would I put vinegar in this soup? That's going to ruin it. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but the excess of that is equally bad. If right. right now a lot of cooks want to put too much vinegar in something and they think, oh, well, this, isn't this interesting? That's like, yeah, no, it's yeah. way too tart, you know. Yeah, totally. So, but it is, it is. And I think the language, you know, in, in some ways, like people are familiar with salt and fat. So acid, I think in a lot of ways is is the sort of most clinical sounding one, you know, it sounds like a word from a, like a lab, but, um, <laughs> but it is, I think in maybe the greatest service I've, I've done for people is to introduce them to that idea. And the thing about it that I always try to translate is like, you actually already know, like we already, you know, I think of it, I grew up in San Diego eating a lot of Mexican food. And so, you know, when I go eat tacos and burritos, I already instinctively know like, oh, this needs a little more salsa. This needs a little more sour cream. I want I want a little more salt in my guacamole. You know, th- that means I'm adjusting, you know, the fat is the sour cream, the acid is the sour cream, the acid is the salsa. You already know because when you're making that perfect bite, you're already adjusting your salt, fat, and acid. You just don't have the vocabulary for it. So all I'm doing is giving people a vocabulary to, to put words to the thing that they already know so that then they can expand that um, thinking to everything else that they're doing in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you. you know, I, you may not know that I was at UC Berkeley back in the 70s and Chez Panisse really opened my mind to watch passionate cooking and food in that kind of country French world of Elizabeth David and, and Richard Olney. And, and, you know, Alice introduced me with a, a letter so that I could work as Richard's assistant. And so it's amazing how Chez Panisse has opened so many of our eyes and hearts mm-hmm. to this thing that we love so much of food and cooking and, and farmers and, and all of the interconnectedness there. It really, I mean, I feel so lucky. And for me, I sort of I didn't grow up knowing anything about fancy restaurants or Chez Panisse. And so it really was sort of this happy accident that I ended up coming to Berkeley to go to college and finding out about this restaurant and saving up to eat there and and, event, and falling in love with it and working there without really understanding its place in like American culinary history. And And then once I started working there, I started to understand what a place it was and like the massive community that it was at the center of and part of and now you know next year will be its 50th birthday I mean 50 years like the amount of people who've passed through there and I just remember I think it was probably so it was 2001 so I had been working there for a year and a half two years and it was the it was the 30th anniversary it was a huge party on the UC Berkeley campus for 500 people and um we were all cooking we had like this we had like 20 lambs set up spit roasting we were making like huge pots of bouillabaisse and people had come you know alumni had come back from all over the world to cook and it was like Martha Stewart was there and George Lucas and I had just graduated college it just felt like the most grand party I had ever been to and I remember feeling like wow like if you are the best you know if you do something the best if you're the best of the world at what you do, you're connected in to all other people in the world who are the best at the world at what they do. And so it just, it felt so amazing to me to be, to feel like I could be part of this incredible community. And that has been at the core of what that restaurant like really has, has given to me is that sense of community of, you know, of the farmers, of the artisans, of the people who make you know, the copper lanterns that sit on the table and that that sense of sort of being part of something is, I think, what really guides a big part of my work and what it is that I try to put out in the world. And so um, 
I had no idea that you were here in, in the seventies. And that is so awesome, Frank. That is so awesome. I love that. So did you, does that mean that then, so, and Alice introduced you to Richard only. So then did you, then at that point was, was he in France? Did you go to France? Well, actually was he, he was it's dividing his time between London and uh, Soles Tuca in Provence. And so I met him in London. Jeremiah Tower had just come over. He had left Chez Panisse uh, half a year earlier. And so they were producing a book every, I think, nine months, a 20-volume series for Time Life, the Good Cook series. Oh, oh I have them. They're right here above my desk. The <laughs> Aren't they series. wonderful? Yeah, I love them. <laughs> Can I take one down and show everyone? Well, like, yeah, yeah, they're yeah, amazing. Yeah. They're legendary. Hold on. Please. Frank still uses them. Oh, they're so amazing. You, you may see my hands and uh, somebody washing shard in the vegetable one. <laughs> oh, really? You're, oh, my God, you're a legend. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I got to take another book down so I can reach. There's... <laughs> okay, here. Well, looking. Okay. I have them all stacked. <laughs> They're so... Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's, like, too exciting. They're all going to fall now. Okay. Don't hurt yourself, Sam. Okay, here's pasta. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh. They're just like these amazing, and they have these amazing end papers. Look at them. They're so uh, cool. And the step-by-step -step photos. All the step-by-step -step photos. Mm -hmm. They're so cool. Mm -hmm. I love these. It's like, it's been a life project for me to collect them all. They just have the best. They're the best. Yeah. yeah. They're the best, and they're still pertinent. Yeah. They're totally amazing. That's so cool. You got to work on these? <laughs> yeah, well, just very briefly. And then I met Richard and was his assistant uh, for just a short while at the house in Provence. Uh, I, I took a quick little month trip to Greece and then came back. And then he introduced me to Julia Child and Simca Beck. And they, I, I was Simca's assistant at her cooking school wow. after she had lunch that I helped Richard cook at his house. And so- Wow. That, uh, a start of um, me falling in love with French food. How old were you? I think I was 22. Wow. 22, 23. Wow. That's so amazing. That's so incredible. That's so special. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, we, when you come here, we've got to talk more about that. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. I mean, it, it sounds like, in a way, Chez Panisse intersected in your life story about the same age as it intersected in my, mm -hmm. in my life story. So, yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. Well, Simi, um, talking about your connectedness and feeling that that connection with community, it seems like that may that feeds into your sense of collaboration with others because the so I mean obviously with the Netflix series um, based on the book and then your podcasts which have been amazing I have to say <laughs> um, and sort of a saving grace for I think uh, so many <laughs> of us during these the last several months. And, um, and so will you talk about your, your sense of collaboration, you know, just your, your, your working relationship with, with Wendy? Absolutely. Oh, um, she's yeah. amazing. Where is it? So, um, well, Wendy McNaughton is the wonderful illustrator who, um, who illustrated my book and we've become really close friends over the years. And, um, and also, and, and I now make this podcast with another friend, Rishi Kesh Hirway. Actually, just this morning I was talking with somebody about, the fact the like dangers of and pleasures of working with your fr well you guys know <laughs> of working with your that. loved ones <laughs> yes. we know that all too well yes <laughs> because it's like both incredibly gratifying and also can be sometimes dangerous and i i mean i would be curious to hear from you but i i feel like because i go to a lot of therapy where i have learned the the tool the term dual relationship and so like i have to always be aware like down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to be aware, like which, 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 which relationship are we in in any given moment? Like, are we in friend? Are we in friend mode, or are we in work mode? And like, you know, and just even whether or not I'm communicating that, at least being clear in my own self, like where my feeling or where my reaction to a certain thing is coming from. And so, trying to be really clear and communicative with people about that. But I, to me, I think I've gotten better at, at, at it over the years and um when it's just made things a lot stronger because we for Wendy and I you know like we didn't know each other the way we met was I I was a fan of her work when she was sort of just leaving advertising she had this blog that she would put up her illustrations on and I started following it and I thought it was amazing and she didn't do a ton of food stuff but I just loved the style 
And because she would, she would, she made a lot of um, like infographics and little sort of charts that explained things. And I knew that this book would need to have charts that explained things. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> and I knew it was about teaching and explaining information in multiple ways. Like I knew I would want to do it, you know, using words, obviously through writing, but also I would want to do it visually. And then there's a third way to do it sort of, which is like with words and visuals, which is the infographic. And so, um, and there was, and also she's very funny and whimsical and that's, that take, can take things like science and chemistry and make it not intimidating, which wow. to me, science is really hard <laughs> and intimidating. And so how do I talk to people about things that seem like really complicated and make them seem not complicated or fun or inviting? And I wanted, I really wanted to strike that tone, but I didn't know her. So I um, wrote her this insane email, like a crazy fan letter. And the the subject line said, you might think I'm stalking you. <laughs> I was like stalking her on, on like Instagram and stuff. And then I was like, and then I said, and you'd be right. And, then <laughs> <laughs> and she opened it anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a bunch of friends in common. And so then I like wrote her this like very flattering email. And then I made, I made one of the things she does, she makes all these Venn diagrams. So I made a Venn diagram of our, all the ways that our lives overlapped and all the people that we knew in common. And I think like I got her, I charmed her. So she, she, we ended up meeting and it turned out that she didn't really know anything about food and she wasn't really like, it wasn't really one of her areas of interest at all. And, um, and so she, I think she more was just curious and in, interested. So she was like, okay, let's try this. And so we, we, basically drew and wrote we illustrated and wrote uh, like a mini version of the book as our proposal and we sold it and then when and she she draws from life she does not draw from photos and mm -hmm. she has to understand something before she can draw it so since she didn't really know anything about cooking I had to essentially teach her so that then she could understand everything so she became like a guinea pig for me on the way to which was this great sort of test because if I couldn't teach Wendy, how could I teach somebody who wasn't standing right in front of me? And so um, I would have, to, I would go to her house and cook, we would cook these dinners and she would draw them. So the very first time I showed up there, I like opened the cabinet to look for, I don't know, salt or something. And it was just like 40 boxes of power bars. Like that's all she ate. <laughs> she like really had never, she like did not cook. And so it really became my great pleasure because now she, she really takes a lot of pride and pleasure in, in cooking. And she, you know, she makes a pot of beans every week and she makes beautiful frittatas and salads. And like, she's so confident. Her mom wrote me this beautiful letter, like thanking me because her dream came true of like cooking a holiday meal with her daughter, which like, mm -hmm. so it's, it's cool. Like I've seen it firsthand affect somebody's life and that's been yeah. really amazing. But to me, like I, I, I have, you know, cooking is a very social is a very social, it's social work, you know, like you get to cook in community with people, you get to eat in community with people. And writing is so lonely, like writing. <laughs> and so if I and writing is about half of what I do. So the other stuff that I do, I always want to do it with people. And um, it's really gr uh, like a great pleasure for me to get to like, I, I feel like stuff's always better when you get to do it with people who bring other stuff to it. And yeah, they challenge you. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, you they think of things you don't think of and I don't know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's good. <laughs> I feel well, like so it's amazing. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about the, the, the new book, uh, what to cook and some of the inspiration behind that. Can you share a little bit of, of that? Of course. Yeah. So, um, well, what's funny is everybody was like, well, what's next? What's, you know, they always want to know like, what's next? What's next? And I'm like, I'm tired. Always. I'm like, I'm so tired. I don't have another idea. It's going to take me forever. It took me 17 years to come up with this one. You know, like, I don't know. How am I going to do another one? And everybody was like, you need another show. You need another book. You need another. And I was like, I'm going to have to take like years off so I can come up with something. And then I literally took one day. I took, I mean, I was in the very back of my mind. I had various ideas, but one day I had, maybe this was like two summers ago. I took one day off and it was like a hot, really hot day. And I was just laying in my bed, like staring at the ceiling in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> and I was like, oh my. And it was just this weird thing where like all of these things, it was like all the puzzle pieces fell into place in my head. And at first I understood it actually as a TV show. And then, then I sort of turned it inside out and I realized it could be a book. 
So, um, cause at first I was trying to think of it as a TV show and I thought, well, most cooking TV shows, right. They, um, they, the, the way like it's called stand and stir, which is like, you know, the person standing at the counter and makes a recipe, you watch it. And then in theory, like you go make that recipe, right? Like if you imagine like a right. typical Ina Garten epi- episode or whatever, right. Which- um yeah or julia child or whatever right like that's that's they call that stand and stir and so everybody like all the netflix and everybody was like your your next show should be a stand and stir like that's what we want from you and in my heart i've been like i don't want to do that that's not who i am like my whole thing is i want to go be with people i want to show people the world like i'm not that kind of a cook like i am here to cook with people so i was like how can i turn stand and stir inside out like how can i also like nobody cooks like that nobody is like well what should i make today like that's not that does not reflect reality (laughs) and so so i was like how could i turn this inside out as a tv show to actually reflect reality and so then i was like well the, the way that it would work is if i went into actual people's homes right and or any scenario if maybe not even a home maybe it's like a community kitchen or meals on wheels kitchen or a hospital kitchen or whatever like any sort of or going camping with someone um and see their real circumstances and you know their what they actually have on hand and then based on what's actually there how much time they have what resources they have and like what they want to eat or who's coming over for dinner then together we formulate a plan and I teach them like chef thinking and I say like this is what we should make based on these constraints right and so really then you learn how to think and so and then the viewer also then learns how to think which is much more valuable than like here's how to make a potato gratin like because if you want to make a potato gratin you just google that potato gratin there's like 90 million recipes I want to teach you something new and so um so then I was like oh that's an interesting I was like, that's cool. And you could have endless episodes of that because they're just endless scenarios, right? They're just endless. Every day is a new day. Every kitchen is a new kitchen. Everybody's reality is different every day. And so um, I realized there was a, there is like a pattern to that. And that there are like sort of four basic constraints that as professional cooks in the same way that like salt, fat, acid, heat was translating how professional cooks think about how to cook and that we use these four elements to understand how to cook that professional cooks enter any kitchen and sort of navigate ourselves based on these four constraints of time, ingredients, resources, and preferences. And so, you know, like in pre COVID times, say (laughs) for most home cooks, uh, like on an average weekday, the typical constraint would have been time. Like if you get home at 5 45 PM and your kids are going to like lose their mind, you know, and that you you may have 25 minutes to get dinner on the table. That's your constraint is like, what can I make in 25 minutes? Um, whereas now, like, and certainly at the beginning of quarantine, when, when things were really, really, really tricky, right? Getting your hands on any groceries were really tricky. The main constraint for most people was ingredients. You're like, well, what do I make? How do I make bread without flour or yeast or whatever, right? Like, how do I make this without this? How do I make this without this? So in a weird way, I actually think this year that COVID has, um, has actually prepared like, uh, or this the experience of cooking this year has, uh, maybe made people a little bit more familiar with the idea of constraint <laughs> as something that we all face, you know? And so, um, but yeah, resources, like a, a great example of a resource limitation is Thanksgiving which like everybody has, everyone knows like the main resource limitation on Thanksgiving is oven space, right? Cause you got it. Like everything on the Thanksgiving table practically comes out of the oven. You're like the turkey, the pie, the like the casserole, the stuffing, the this, the this. And you're like, how do I, and they're all different temperatures and you're like, how do I do it? And it's not all going to work or whatever. Right. And so it's like, if your oven is your limitation, then you have to make other choices based on that limitation. So, um, and sometimes it's like you have too much, too many tomatoes. What do you do? Other times it's like, you don't have enough cheese. What do you do? So those are the realities that we all deal with on our, in our daily base, in our daily basis. And those are also what chefs who come to the restaurant and like, they need to use this up before it goes bad. Or today this cook didn't show up and that, so that person we're putting on the grill is not that strong. So we can't make 
the grilled dishes that hard today. You know, those are the real, that's the kind of stuff that we're thinking about too. So it's just kind of translating that, that and teaching people how to be a little bit more dynamic and flexible. And so that you're not, you're not feeling bad when you can't like replicate the like 10 dishes in the issue in this month's issue of whatever magazine, because guess what? Like that's not based in reality. That's right. based in a fake kitchen. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit like, you know, you, you go to the market in that, informs the menu you don't have a menu and then go to the market you know totally and that's just how i think intuitive cooks work totally totally exactly and so i mean for a lot of people there you go that's the, the ingredient and for me that's absolutely it until like you know and then like toward the end of the week when i'm like well this stuff's rotting <laughs> or like this person's coming over and that's a vegan so like i can't use that you know or whatever and then you're like well then if the vegan's coming over then that becomes the anchor around which I build the menu, you know, so like the each day or each meal, it sort of shifts a little bit, but absolutely. It's like based for me on, I would say on the average, like day to day basis, it's the ingredients are my, are my like most sort of regular constraint. Yeah. Well, in your travels and, and even thinking about where you want to travel uh, as far as food markets, you know, for me, I certainly, you know, I think about the Venice market and I think of Barcelona and I think of Nice and these places are some of the most exciting places on the planet for food, for somebody that just to go and to see how the vendors interact with the, the local people. What are some of your experiences from your travels and of where you've been and where you want to go? Well, probably my favorite market city that I've ever been to is Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And um, I just feel, and also I feel like I could go to Mexico City 3,000 more times and still not even get, I mean, it's so huge and so just like, there's just so much. And I feel like I could st go there countless more times and not even get to see everything that I would want to see. But um, I just, yeah, like there are so many amazing ingredients in Mexican cooking that I have not even begun to, you know, understand or have in re relationship with. But um, I am a crazy fool for beans and I'm a crazy fool for peppers. <laughs> So like every time I go Speaking there, I'm just language. like, yes. yeah, I'm just like filling all my bags with beans and peppers <laughs> and praying that I don't get stopped at the border, which I always do. But so I'm always like, Bob, it's totally safe. Totally safe. These beans. Totally safe. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I have a problem. I, I buy cucumbers. Any, oh, any yeah. ever traveling, if I see nice cucumbers, I collect cucumbers and peppers too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have like more peppers than I could ever. I don't even know. Like, I have seventy kinds of peppers downstairs, and I'm like, what am I doing with all of this? But um, yeah, pepper and like, it's just and also sometimes I just love going to see what is happening, you know, because a lot of this stuff is fresh stuff that I wouldn't even know begin to know what to do with or how to use. But I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, like one of the most amazing sort of sensory experiences in Mexico City is when the um the their the like a uh, banana leaf vendor is like is like preparing the banana leaves to be sold and they're like these it's like it's kind of like reminds me of the Persian carpet vendor <laughs> because they're like they're kind of like um like it's almost like they're like airing out a carpet you know and it's this huge piece of banana leaf that's just like mega thing and it's just you you kind of imagine like wow somebody's going to take that home and turn it into thousands of mollies like mm -hmm. it's just I love thinking about what people are going to make and all the smells and the tastes and it's just it feels it's a sensory it's like it's such a sensory delight so to me, that's definitely, I would say, one of the most incredible places I've ever been. And I've never been to Southeast Asia. So I would really love to visit like Thailand, Indonesia, um, Vietnam, anywhere, anywhere over there, Malaysia, Singapore, I've heard like, obviously has like incredible markets and incredible like food stalls. But um, no, I'm like, uh, that is my, I would just eat everything. <laughs> I would eat everything. I would eat everything. Yeah, it would be amazing. So well, are there any other markets that you like um, um, stateside or or the, the, the Ferry Building in you know, yeah. San Francisco? Oh yeah, of course I love the San Francisco Ferry Building. I mean, I also am a, I I have become such an insane person. I've become like so. I'm the person like I am. The, this is I think the like unique intersection of my Iranianness 
and my like Shapanese upbringing, it's like really kind of turned me into the like most extreme version of that person who will cross a bridge for a tomato, you know, like, <laughs> like, uh, like my mom, my mom. So like, uh, so, so my mom would drive across Southern California, like 200 miles for bread. Like, like to get Persian bread, you know, there's, uh, in Southern California, there was this, uh, maybe not 200 miles, 88 miles to Irvine, to this bakery that would made Sangak bread, which is like, uh, for, for the viewers who might not know the, um, it's like Sang, Sang in Farsi means little like river stones. And so Sangak bread is like traditionally baked in these ovens that are like lined with these river stones, these pebbles basically. So they're like these flat breads that are kind of like these dimpled flat breads and there are these long like delicious and you get them warm and they have like sesame seeds mm -hmm. and nigella seeds on them but in iran you never eat day old bread like you just go down to the bakery in the morning and you get fresh warm bread and so um and so my and there's a place called the wholesome choice in irvine it's it's like what used to be just a regular grocery store like a safeway that was then like bought by or like taken over by an iranian family and turned into a middle eastern grocery but it's the size of a whole grocery store and so they have, it's, it's not just like a little grocery. It's like a big grocery. And so they have a whole thing that's just the sangag bread, but then, then they have a limit. It's like two per person. And so, <laughs> and so my mom would like put all the children in the car so that we could all stand in line so we could get the mat, you know, two, so, oh like, so we could get eight instead of just two. So smart. So <laughs> yeah. Smart. Yeah. So like, it's like Iranian, I feel like, I mean, maybe it's more of an immigrant thing or, but like, it's definitely like, I have known many Iranians who will drive very far for a thing. And now I'm that person who's like, there's a farmer's market, like literally a block from my house, like a 90 second walk. And I will drive all the way to the other side of town because the other tomatoes from the other farm that's like... <laughs> 15 seconds away from that part I like them better like <laughs> so I like that kind not of an crazy answer though. for your specific question except that like I'm the crazy person who has like the one stall in each place where I already know that I want to go to that because like for example in New York like I really love in Chelsea Market there's seed and mill tahini which I think is really delicious and they have it make it really yeah, they make the like really tasty halva too. And then also in Chelsea Market, there's a place called Miznon, which makes the like um, the falafel sandwiches and like the craziest, fluffiest pita I've ever had in my whole life. Delicious. And so like I will cross all the way to the West High Highway to go to go get like I'm I'm just like it's that yeah. So I don't know if you name a city, I'll tell you like what the three weird places on all the like different places are that I would like to go to. But um, yeah. How about <laughs> That's <Houston>? who I am. <laughs> you ever go to Houston? I've never. I I haven't been to Houston since I was probably five years old. So tell me, what what should I go? Well, what no, I everyone just talks about. We haven't been to Houston in years, but um, but there are so many. I mean, you have access. There's access to every kind of food you can possibly imagine. Every culture seems to be represented, and um, so it's. Uh, we need to. We need to add that to the yeah. list. We meet up yes. in Houston. Yeah. Amazing, totally. Yeah. Talking about traveling for food, you know, I, I, you and I spoke, I don't know how many. I think it was maybe three years ago. Three years ago, yeah. I think so, maybe four. I don't even remember I don't, now. I don't, I don't either, but you, we had talked about, um, you were asking, we were talking about Nodus, uh, Persian New Year. And, you know, I am, I, actually, I was born in Houston, but grew up in the South. Um, I'm, I don't really consider Houston the South, but um, in Birmingham. And, um, and so for my parents and I guess my mother specifically to seek out ingredients, you know, when she would, when she didn't have the fresh, she had her, all of her dried herbs and her pistachios and everything else from Iran. Um, but when she needed cilantro, you know, and there wasn't cilantro or there wasn't dill and there weren't other, you know, so many other things that she, I think that, I mean, the family would take a trek to Atlanta, which was, you know, just, a, just over two hours away um, to, you know, to, 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 fill the, to fill the larder, I guess, at home refrigerator. And so, um, that might be a little bit of an Iranian thing too. So <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so I wanted just getting back to the Netflix show just because oh, yeah. that is, I, you know, I mean the, the book so amazing and has reached so many people, but I, I feel like that the show 
has such a broad, or must have such it a really broad does. reach. And so for people to be able to connect, you know, with you and then with the book, you know, through that, um, how did you choose where you were going to travel? I mean, how did all of that come about? Yeah, I mean, it's so making a television show is no joke. <laughs> and um, I think there's the like, there's the version you have, in, there's the dream version you have in your head of how you think and hope it will go. And then rea there's reality. So, um, which is like budgets and calendars. And also like, if other people on Netflix were already going to a country, you know, a, a different show was already going to a certain place, like we couldn't also go there. So um, there were certain limitations like that. But what um, I knew for me, Italy was going to be really important because I had lived there. So I knew for at least one of the episodes, either salt or fat, I wanted to go to Italy. And I, I really wanted to do fat in Italy. So I'm glad we got to do that. Um, I, I always had thought, I, the, the other thing I originally had conceived was that we would go to multiple countries. This is before budgets. I was like, we should go to many countries per episode. Like, because the whole idea is that it's a universal philosophy. And so wherever you go, it will be proven. So um, I wanted to go, for example, for salt, I wanted to go to Belize, where the world's largest salt flats are, and then also to Japan, so that you can be in these like two totally different places and see that the same sort of principles were in action. But, um, but that didn't happen. And so, <laughs> and, so, and so executives, what can I say? But, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but ultimately I was really happy. You know, one thing that was really important to me was to not focus too much on Europe and the Western countries. And I wanted to sort of try to spread things around the world. I, 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 I did really want to go to Iran. And to me, um, that was going to be acid, obviously. Iranian food is very acidic. We are obsessed with sourness. And, um, and we came very close to going, but at the last second, just some things happened politically that made it really challenging for us to go. So what was kind of curious, though, was that um, we, we shifted gears at the very last second and switched to Mexico. But so many of the ingredients, were, we were going to do sour oranges in Iran, and we just did sour oranges in Mexico. Like, and so, um, and Mexico was always the other place that I wanted to go. We couldn't go to Iran for, for acidity. So I was really happy to go there. And also like, I have a friend who from Mexico, she's always been like, if you cut you open, if we cut you open, there's like a, you know, Mexican food will fall out of you. So it's <laughs> like in your heart. You know? so, <laughs> so I was very happy to go there. But um, no, I feel it, like to me, I just feel so lucky that I, I got to travel and meet new people and see, you know, and, and have experiences that were different than I think the kinds of things that I had seen before on, on food TV. And it was really important for me to show the kinds of different kinds of cooks and different kinds of people than I had traditionally seen on food TV, because um, I think that can be, that can you know, paint only a certain, a very narrow picture of like what it is to be a great chef or what it is to be, you know, to like have something valuable to say. And my goal is to sort of expand that. You know, that seeing those, those images in Japan of all of those artisan craftsmen making those ingredients with so much love and care mm -hmm. and respect. It, that was so fascinating that you can weave in so many layers by incorporating these craftsmen that are so committed. Yeah, I mean, thank you. It was, we had all so much help on that Japan episode from locals who really knew the landscape and really just were so familiar with people who have been doing really incredible work and it was one of my favorite things actually about that Japan episode and probably like one of my favorite takeaways and things I'm like strangely the most proud of in a way, like about the show is, um, so my friend Yuri, who's in that episode, she's the chef I, I go on the little salt seaweed adventure with. And then later she cooks fish with me. Um, she and our friend Taichi, who's not really in the show. He, um, um, he, uh, Let's see. So he, um, they had traveled across Japan maybe two or three times with us over the course of our filming, which was a week. Like they had flown, they had basically interrupted their lives to mm. go out of their way to do all of this work with us and be on this show. And we weren't paying them anything. Like they really went out of their way to, to do a lot of work with us. They were so generous and so incredible. 
And so they, um, they, they were amazing. And I remember we were so exhausted at the end on the last day. And I was like, you guys, I don't understand. Like, why did you do this? Why, why did you like give it, give me so much of yourselves and give me so much of your energy? Like, I'm so grateful to you, but I don't deserve this from you. And they said, Oh, we didn't do this for you. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, they were like, they were like the people in Japan, um, you know, for us, we value, you know, unfortunately, actually, we don't value, we have such little, almost sort of national self-confidence that we, um, we care so much what the West thinks of us that, that it was important to us to have you value these, tra- these disappearing traditions because we knew that it would create an, a pro- like a national pride here in, in our country for preserving things like this soy sauce that's disappearing and this salt, you know, these traditions that are disappearing. And so, I mean, there is a lot of sort of complicated things in that. Like I wish that that's, you know, but like sort of colonizing sort of self-hatred didn't exist or whatever, but <laughs> If I could be like, if something that I did could be a force for good and ultimately, you know, create awareness in and like a market for supporting something like that soy sauce, which honestly is the only soy sauce I buy anymore. It's so incredibly delicious. Um, and and I, I feel like here in the Bay Area and when I've been to New York, when I've been to other big cities, I've seen a lot more of those double brewed like wooden air, uh, barrel aged soy sauces in the last few years. Like I feel like there is a market now being created for them, then um, that would make me so proud and so happy. It's really awesome. Incredible impact. I mean, that's really fantastic, Sammy. Thank you. Yeah, should we mention should really quickly to everyone, um, uh, there is there is a little Q, but it's in the chat now, but just to all of our audience members, there is a Q&A function in the Zoom and you can leave a question. If you have a question for me, I guess, or us, <laughs> You can leave a question and um, not in the chat, but in the Q&A thing, you can click right to the bottom and then other people can upvote. And then the most popular questions will we'll leave a little bit of time in the last 10 minutes and we'll answer audience questions. Thanks to me. Oh, sure. Thanks. <laughs> I'll take care of it, Eric. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> Technically proficient. We barely made it on to the, the, the webinar. So... <laughs> You guys don't need me. <laughs> um, but, Samin, I wanted to ask you, just with the last several months, with everything being, you know, just so, um, I mean, everyone's been impacted in, 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 in some way, uh, some more than, more than others. But um, in your day-to-day life, I mean, it seems like you've had a lot of positive things come out of it. I mean, with the, the, the podcast, uh, lasagna making... <laughs> Uh, it sounds like you've been working on the book, what to cook, um, yeah. and, and, and gardening. Do I, do I understand mm-hmm. correctly that? You yeah. Know? The garden, I would say is the most, uh, probably prolific where I've been the most prolific. <laughs> and, and were you gardening before? Were you a gardener before? Or is this a new, um, a new project for you? New yeah. I've been gardening maybe I think six or seven years now. I mean, I started in just, I, I moved to where I live now a year ago. So, um, and here, this is the first time I have like a ground to plant in but before this I lived in a little apartment so I had I just had this like ever expanding collection of containers Mm -hmm. which I got pretty good at like having kind of a good harvest and so I had flowers and beans and tomatoes and all sorts of different things and um I as a like a perfectionist immigrant child remember in the beginning I well in the very beginning of gardening I was like well this is you know I don't want to garden when I'm just like a tenant somewhere because then I'll have to like leave this stuff behind and like what a waste is that like you know and which is just like the worst way to think about it (laughs) like of course you just want to like gardening isn't about the thing it's about the whole experience the time it's like it's not about like the thing you leave behind at all like at all it's about the whole process is really where the joy and, and all of the value of it is. So that was one major mistake. And then um, later I, I was like, oh man, I really don't feel good about all of the stuff that, you know, it just feels like such a waste because I keep killing stuff. And I feel like it's just, I'm, I'm so bad at this. Like I keep killing stuff. And this master gardener was like, no, 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 that's a huge part of it. It's like, you're going to kill so much stuff 
Like you're going to mess up so much stuff. That's, that's what gardening is, is like, there's going to be a huge learning curve for you where you figure out like, what's too much sun, what's not enough sun, what's too much water, what's not enough water. Like maybe it's like something's too hot for where you are too cold or whatever, you know? And, and I think that familiarity and that sort of like paying attention is, is, is that's the gardening. And so for me, it's like having something to like go outside and have a relationship to. And um, yeah, it's kind of somebody, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, it's, it's the opposite of so many things in my life, which are like faster, faster, harder, 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 (laughs) you know, (laughs) it's like slower, slower, like, yeah there's and so it's it's a it's been a very healing healing thing and i feel really really lucky yeah so man you want to jump in and answer a few questions before we for sure happily happily we got a lot of them starting to pile up here and we don't have very much time so (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) i'll start with the first one uh so mean we are curious about father b could we see i'm so sorry (laughs) father's not here right now i sent her away because she is so she's so naughty i I worry she would be really disturbed. <laughs> she would call the disturbance, so she's not here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the second one. It says, what is your go-to meal or what do you make when you don't feel like cooking? Or what do you, okay. when you just need some quick comfort food? Okay. My go-to meal like that I make probably at least once a week is, uh, well, the true answer is popcorn with nutritional yeast, but... <laughs> but the like slightly healthier is um i make rice in the rice cooker and then there is this i wrote a column about this so you can find and maybe we actually gary if you're in here you can stick the link in the chat but i made um i make this dish i call it mara's tofu my friend mara like taught me how to make this tofu from her childhood which is so simple and delicious and it's basically this like hippie dish which i I never, I did not grow up eating tofu. It was not a thing that like, it has ever felt like so delicious and yummy to me. But this combination of things is like so strangely, just like so delicious. So it's medium firm tofu that she's, I, you slice into maybe like centimeter thick pieces and you drizzle, she drizzles this um, Bragg's liquid aminos, which is kind of like a hippie version of soy sauce. It's unfermented soy sauce. If you don't have that, you can use soy sauce. And then, um, and then she like fries it in coconut oil in the pan. And because it's the medium firm tofu, it gets, um, it, it, it gets kind of custardy, like a scrambled, like a, like a omelet text, like a custard texture on the center, but the coconut oil gets so hot that the outside gets this like lacy crisp texture. Mm. So I usually eat like that tofu, which is just like umami deliciousness and crisp of like com- combination of textures rice and then whatever like boiled broccoli or like sauteed broccoli or spinach just like that is my like simplest dinner I have it at least once a week and it makes me feel so happy Mm -hmm. and not like I'm gonna die Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay um I have a question from Jessica Moody and she says I have a five-year-old who eats almost anything including okra and brussels sprouts and tofu but a husband who is pickier, how can I get him to fall in love with seasoned vest- vegetables he's hesitant to love or even try? Interesting, husband. Okay. <laughs> I think, <laughs> to me, I don't know, Frank, you guys weigh in on this one. I think it's all about how, well, two things. One is, I think, roasting, like getting the things brown and caramely is a first step. Because, like, that getting it sort of crispy on the outside, brown and caramely on the outside, on the, yeah, brown and You just want that browning and sweetness is always going to make things more like attractive. But then you, because then you've created the sweetness, you want to create a nice um, contrast with some sort of a dressing. And that's where like the condiment deliciousness comes in. So um, like some sort of side thing to dip it in. So if it's, if he's like very picky, as in he has like very, very sort of like simple tastes of like a child, sorry, husband. Um, (laughs) then maybe you want to create something that's like reminiscent of like dipping you. It's like a sweet potato that you dip then in yogurty sauce. Or if, if he's a little more adventurous, then maybe you dress like those roasted sweet potatoes or roasted vegetables with like a sweet, like something like a balsamic vinegar dressing, like, you know, the sweet and sour dressing or something like that, or a honey vinaigrette or a mustard honey vinaigrette. 
but I think you kind of want to build sweet and sour or fat and sweet and sour in there, but, um, and, and definitely do some like roasting. Those are the, those are the, those are the tricks I would offer. Awesome. Okay. I have a question from Clay Morrison and this one is for Frank and Pardis. Uh, yes. I'd love to know what Pardis and Samin's favorite Iranian restaurants are in America. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is not really a restaurant. It's my it's my parents' home. <laughs> um, I haven't been to too many Persian restaurants in um, in the states. I think I'm just totally spoiled because my mother still cooks Persian yeah. food for me. So yeah, and she's incredible. Yeah. You know the kuku sabzi and mm -hmm. all like that. stews. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, there's an egg food called Khonesh Abadim Jun, which I love um, so much. And uh, another little adaptation for my mom is um, because it's typically served with sour grapes, which, you know, is part of the acid that we use in uh, in Persian cooking. But my mom has discovered that um, that very young muscadine grapes work as well. No, so, that's so, um, that's, I love that kind of stuff, using like the local version. That's so cool. Yeah, we had those growing at our farm, mm -hmm. and so yes. Yeah. So I mean, where do you like? Where do you, I mean? Because you, growing up on the West Coast, you I think you had access to more Persian. Restaurants. Yeah, we had endless. My mom is an amazing cook, and so my mom's rule is like she wouldn't let us eat anything out in the world that she could make. So we only were allowed to eat at Cello Kababis, like which are like the the kebab restaurants, or like when we went to a Persian restaurant, she never let us eat order food that was like home, the, the stuff she would have made at home. So we were only or, allowed to order like rice and kebabs. So um, I think probably like probably most of the kebab places that are, I mean, at this point, I'm not so familiar with any of them, like any of them anymore, but like you can just go up and down Westwood Boulevard and it would all be delicious. But um, one incredible Persian restaurant that I have loved recently in, in the last couple of years is in Brooklyn and it's called Sofre yeah, and yes. it's so good. It's yes. really, I thought that that was really exquisite and I really loved the people who run it. And it was, it was, it felt a lot like eating in someone's home, which I really loved. My sisters have been there. We have not been there yet, but um, mm -hmm. when we can travel mm -hmm. again to New York, we yeah. will. So, I mean, this is an interesting question. Um, this is from Sophie Burge. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. She says, thanks, Samin. You are amazing. What are your top three favorite kitchen gadgets or items? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. I would say, um, I okay, I wish I was down there right now. I would show you. Okay, I have probably the thing I use every day and I am like feel lost without is like a $2.50 Xylus peeler. It's like a, a cheap Y-shaped yeah. vegetable peeler. Anytime I'm in a kitchen that has like the classic vegetable peeler that makes you hold your hand, like that's just like the old school ones. I'm like, no, 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 no. I like the Y-shaped ones because they're much more ergonomic. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, I also have, I just, I love my cast iron pan. It's always on my stove. I use it for everything. And I also use my mortar okay. and pestle for everything. Uh, they're asking me to wrap up, you guys. Okay. So we do have another event that we have to go to. So um, this was amazing. Um, I really hate that you couldn't be here with us, Samin. Me and, too. Next year. Next year. <laughs> but I'm already making plans in my mind on how I can get you back so that we can meet face to face and you can meet meet the people in our community. And, and I would love spot. nothing more. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank and Pardis, um, for thank doing this. Thank you so I'm much, Frank and Pardis. Thank you. It's amazing. It couldn't have worked out better that you guys already knew each other. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah. So thanks to everyone who's watching. And um, check out our website for all the other events that we have coming up for the remainder of the season. And thank you guys for being here. Thanks to the wonderful audience. Thank you for all your questions. Bye. Take care. <laughs>